Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your break and got some lunch and also got to uh, browse the special exhibition, Our War II. For our next session, we have two friends to present. One, Dr. Threat, was involved as an advisor on our special exhibition board. Uh, and she was also here last year with our education department's electronic field trip on manufacturing victory. And we also have Dr. Elizabeth Norman, who I think is definitely in the top two, maybe the top one as far as most attended programs we've ever had when she came and presented on uh, Band of Angels and the LSU Health Science Center had uh, all of their nursing students and faculty come to attend. So it was our folks plus their folks, and it was a great evening, and it's great to have Beth back. But to uh, chair our session, it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. John Curatola. John is the Samuel Z. Murray Stone Senior Historian here at the museum's Jenny Craig Institute, a Marine Corps officer for 22 years, John served in Operation Provide Hope in Somalia, Operation Iraqi Freedom, and in the 2005 tsunami relief efforts after that calamity. Uh, John has his PhD from University of Kansas, which he always likes to lord over me, coming from Missouri. <laughs> and he is, uh, his focus is, I don't know if you have a focus, because you're all over the place, but uh, primarily on air power, but also atomic warfare. His books, Bigger Bombs for a Brighter Tomorrow and Autumn of Our Discontent, are about the post-war nuclear warfare and plans. His third book is coming out, we think, next year, yes. about uh, the US Army learning from their amphibious operations in North Africa, Sicily, Italy, and how that helped in the D-Day invasion and beyond. So without further ado, it's my pleasure. John, take it away. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's an honor to be here today, uh, especially with this particular topic. Just before we started, I was talking with one of our panelists, and we're looking at the picture of Fred Astaire here, and it reminded me of the quote from Ginger Rogers as, yeah, I did the same things. I did it backwards and with heels, you know? And so I think that kind of helps set the tone of, of what we're looking at uh, here today. So um, it's, it's been a, a wonderful morning, and it's going to prove to be an even better afternoon. Um, and I'm lucky to have uh, these two wonderful ladies uh, here to my left. And my far left is Professor Carissa Threat. She's an associate professor of history at Chapman University, where she teaches courses on the US and African American history. Her research interests uh, are in race and gender in the 20th century, history, civil rights, community activism, and war and society. Her first book, which we'll be talking about today, is Nursing Civil Rights, Gender and Race in the Army and Nurse Corps, which was published by the University of Illinois Press in 2015. And she won the 2017 Lavinia Doc Book Award for the American Association of History of Nursing. Uh, she was also the author of several books and chapters and essays. Her second book, Black Intimacies in War, uh, examines home front activities, wartime participation, and the intimate relationships among African Americans in the Second World War. Make sure I actually watch my time here. Well, good afternoon, and I have the distinct pleasure of being on a panel right after lunch. So I hope you all enjoyed your lunch today. Um, I want to begin by thanking the World War II Museum and Connie Gentry and the entire staff at the Jenny Craig uh, Institute for the Study of War and Democracy for this invitation to per uh, participate in the Women's History Symposium. Over the last few years, working with uh, Kimberly Geis and the entire uh, rest of the curatorial staff on the Our War II uh, exhibit has been really an honor, and I'm thrilled to see the results uh, in person, finally. So, as it had with World War I, wartime nursing experiences during the Second World War resulted in new and innovative medical services. Over the course of the war, nearly 60,000 Army nurses and nearly 14,000 Navy nurses, along with uncounted civilian nurses who contracted with the nurse corps, turned a long history of nursing 
for and on behalf of our nation's soldiers that had been formalized with the, uh, as women's services in 1901 for the Army Nurse Corps and in 1908 for the Navy Nurse Corps. At the forefront of wartime nursing, military nurses made and helped support crucial advances in the physical and mental treatment of soldiers and civilians impacted by war. The nature of their jobs and calling meant that while their rank, pay, uh, access to benefits, among a whole host of other complications uh, and other challenges, um, set out nurses to nursing to be a difficult task, a different difficult job, and a difficult calling, especially during the Second World War. There had been broad agreement that nursing was a necessity during war, that the presence of nurses in places that were often deemed inappropriate for women uh, was a necessity as well. These nurses did their duty domestically and in far-flung places as far as the South Pacific, Asia, Africa, and Europe. They waded ahead the shores of Anzo Beachhead five days after troops landed in January 1944. Six nurses would eventually lose their lives during enemy bombing attacks in February of 1944 in that, uh, in that uh, waiting ahead in the beachhead. They arrived on Utah Beach four days after D-Day, and they lived in the most desolate places. Some faced enemy capture, many risked de death, disease, and most were remembered that they had served with pride and honor, both by, amongst themselves, but also amongst the soldiers uh, that they were uh, treating. So there's just some of the pictures up here, just so you get a sense of um, many of the women who participated as nurses during the Second World War. Nursing the sick is definitely a woman's prerogative, wrote Lieutenant Colonel Elsie Schneider the, uh, to the chief of the Army Nurse Corps in 1950. While this is an accepted truism in military nursing and had been throughout the first half of the 20th century, the question of which nurses it pertained to was often debatable. As a matter of fact, African-American women found themselves struggling against the reality that despite their sex, their racial identity became the primary determinant to their acceptance to the Army Nurse Corps. So what I'm gonna be talking to you about for the next few minutes is the story of how black nurses and their supporters fought, demanded, and negotiated both the opportunity to join the Army Nurse Corps and to call for an end to discrimination against black female nurses. And we can see in this image behind me one of the propaganda posters that highlights really the desperate call and also the importance of female nurses to the mission of this war. Nurses are desperately needed. Nurses play a vital role. So why was it that race played a significant role in not allowing black nurses to serve when they wanted to? So while I'm gonna focus on World War II today, this story has a much larger and longer history as an important goal for the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses and their black uh, supporters, black activist supporters, and their white allies, who had spent quite a long time, the organization as an advocacy for nursing had got its start in 1908, largely because African-American female nurses could not join, many could not join the National American Nurses Association. Um, there are a number of chapters that barred uh, black nurses from joining the local chapters, which meant they couldn't join the national organization. And so out of that uh, frustration in terms of professional, uh, having a professional organization, we get the uh, founding of the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses. In the years between 1908 and the Second World War, one of the main focuses of the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses was the desegregation and acceptance of black nurses in the Army Nurse Corps. 
And we can see here two images uh, of two women who played a vital role in that, uh, in that campaign. Um, Mabel Stompers was the executive secretary of the uh, NACGN from 1934 to 1946, who uh, was really great friends with Eleanor Roosevelt. We heard about Eleanor Roosevelt today earlier, uh, who spent a lot of time writing and meeting with Eleanor Roosevelt, trying to get her to further support the cause of black nurses in the Second World War. And of course, uh, Estelle Massey Riddle, who served as the organization's president just until just before the Second World War. So once the Second World War breaks out into the fray of the Second World War, African-American female nurses found themselves, quote, engaged in a total war. One that found them trying to both support civilian society and the military while mobilizing and eventually fighting a war on the one hand and engaged in a larger civil rights struggle that saw military participation and military service as a means of challenging racism in a war fought to defend freedom and democracy. In the fall of 1940, representatives of the NAACP and the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses were invited to a conference to discuss the National Defense Program and nursing with particularly the Nursing Council on National Defense was a major conversation at this, organ at this, um, this meeting. At both this meeting and other meetings on the National Defense Program, the main subject was, what are we gonna do about black nurses? How can we ensure, and I quote here, full opportunity to Negro nurses for service in the Army, the Navy, and the Red Cross? Now, they had some early assurances that along with African-American men as soldiers, that they were going to be an important part of the total war mobilization plan. And the NACGN, however, in that case, was also uh, loosely or lightly concerned that this was not going to be followed through. So they quickly organized their own what they called defense committee. Uh, just to ensure that they had a backup plan if these promises at these early meetings in, in 1940 uh, kind of fell through, that they would have already an organization, a committee, that would focus on getting the word out to having black nurses along with African-American men as soldiers be full participants in the war. In 1940, some of the earliest African-American female nurses who attempt to join the Army Nurse Corps were met with the following statement. I regret to tell you that your application for appointment in the Army Nurse Corps cannot be given favorable consideration, as there are no provisions in the Army regulations for the appointment of colored nurses in the Nurse Corps. It is regretted that circumstances preclude a more favorable reply. Now you can imagine this was exactly what the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses uh, had con were concerned about, had really worried over, but were also very um, thoughtful in having this, def this defense committee already in place. Uh, they understood that there was going to be contradictions in what was said in 19 for early 1940 and actually what was done. Uh, they also had a history of this. Uh, you know, earlier conversations with the Red Cross about the ways in which African-American female nurses were categorized in terms of recruitment, also meant that African-American nurses were often uh, left as kind of the last, the last group that was categorized for service. So, uh, you know, this was something that they smartly already knew that they had to worry about and think about. So the War Department does, in fact, and the Surgeon General, uh, the Surgeon General McGee does, in fact, eventually uh, change its mind and has to change its mind in terms of how they're going to utilize African American women as nur nurses, and they decide in late 1940 to institute or propose a quota of an allotment of first 48 and then 56 black nurses to serve mainly as African American soldiers. 
And the Army Nurse, uh, Army Nurse Corps Chief, Julia Flick, suggested that this quota might be increased by as many as 50 or more black nurses uh, in the coming time, particularly after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. So the, uh, you know, the idea here was to ensure that they had, along with the 10% the uh, quota instituted for black men as soldiers, that they would, it, the Army Nurse Corps would really fall in line uh, with that. And so the call for 48 and then 56 black nurses made sense at the time. In the wake of the bombing of Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, in fact, they do increase the number of black nurses they call for. What I want to say as an aside is that the institution of quotas during World War II was not in the eyes of many black nurses an affirming attempt to integrate the military or to open up new opportunities for black nurses. As a matter of fact, quotas served the military by really limiting the inclusion of African Americans, both in the war effort and in the armed forces of the United States to ensure their limited numbers. Oh, let, me, no, let me leave this here. Uh, by doing so, the Army really boldly asserted the second-class citizenship of black Americans while fighting a war obstinately for the goals of democracy and equality. The picture behind me is uh, a picture of one of the first group of black nurses who were enlisted in uh, the Army Nurse Corps. This is the Fort Bragg uh, group um, Fort Bragg Hospital Unit Number Two from 1941. Um, I love this picture because it really you could see the pride in these women's faces as they sit for um, for this picture um, as well. One of those group members is a woman by the name of Gertrude Ivory uh, Bertram. This is Gertrude uh, in at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, in 1943. I like to show this picture because in the previous picture, which she's also, uh, which she, you can also see her in, um, she was one of the first group of first black nurse, uh, nurses who were, uh, somebody said the word earlier today, voluntold. They were going to be, uh, they should enlist in the Army Nurse Corps. So on one hand, uh, how do you get black nurses even when they are, uh, they get rejection letters. How do you get them to then continue trying to join the Army Nurse Corps? Well, that had a lot to do with Mabel Stompers and other supporters of the Black Nurse Campaign, who were really mindful about picking and choosing Black nurses who they believed would fit the bill and who would not be rejected eventually uh, by the Army um, to, for service with the Army Nurse Corps. And Ivy Bertram was one of, of those groups. She actually writes in her oral histories that she really had no uh, interest, and she saw the difficulties in enlisting in the Army Nurse Corps, but she was encouraged, and by encouraged, I think she really met uh, told that she should do this uh, by Mabel Stompers. So you here you have the, you know, a selected group of, of African-American nurses who are really told to be the forefront, the forerunners of uh, the first group of black nurses. So Ivy Bertrand. Black nurses also understood that their attempts to join the Army Nurse Corps and be part of war mobilization efforts uh, in the U.S. military was not just about serving their country, but was also serving a larger purpose for African Americans. Uh, we can see in, uh, in 1942, the National Association of Color Graduate Nurses in their, in their nursing news bulletin wrote that we, I quote, we are urging all state and local associations to cooperate with the double V campaign of the Pittsburgh Courier. Besides working for democracy abroad, we must work for democracy at home. Nurses too well know what it means to be denied democracy. So they placed their campaign to join the Army Nurse Corps within a larger civil rights campaign. And they had already done that for several years. They had worked alongside with the NAACP, Mabel Stompers as her, in her role as executive secretary of the National Association of Color Graduate Nurses, had uh, searched out and wrote Eleanor Roosevelt pretty regularly about, uh, about the black nurse cause here. But here in this particular statement, in 1942, you can see that the uh, black nurse professional organization is placing the nurse cause 
within a larger context of the Second World War and, and the civil rights movement that had really got its push as part of the Double V campaign. Victory abroad over racism, victory at home over, um, excuse me, fascism, victory at home over racism. So during the first two years of the war, the quotas that the Army Nurse Corps had instituted uh, really remained pretty static. The response for, to and by African Americans to join uh, to joining the Nurse Corps also remained. There was still a high response and interest, but those quotas didn't move very much. As a matter of fact, they moved from uh, 50, 55, 60, 65, um, and this was uh, frustrating for most African Americans writ large. There were consistent newspaper articles about the racism that African American female nurses faced in joining the Army Nurse Corps. Civil rights organizations recognized that what on the surface appeared to be a general acceptance of black nurses by the Army Nurse Corps was really a force by which the Army and the War Department could exclude most of them from service. And that, again, is by the controlling of the numbers here. Black nurse supporters and civil rights activists were actually then starting to really mount a campaign uh, against uh, the restriction of army nurses as the war progressed. And as we can see behind me, there is a map of the United States which really draws out how the military organized uh, the country in sections. And for the most part, most African American nurses, when they were assigned uh, as part of the Army Nurse Corps, were really uh, assigned to bases in section uh, eight, and in section uh, four, and those are really the kind of southern and southwest sections. So not only are they uh, allotted a quota number that really restricts their number in a whole, but when they are assigned, they're assigned to bases that black troops predominate, and that, uh, that really leaves them to uh, not being available um, throughout the nation as well. Now things become critical beginning really in 1943. Nurse shortages had already existed, but beginning in 1943, uh, there was a, a, a critical nursing shortage that starts to become very obvious to uh, mobilization efforts. And um, the National Nursing Council for War Service did an investigation with the National Association of Color Graduate Nurses in which they produced in 1943 a joint report. And this joint report really highlighted for public attention some of the problems of racial quotas in wartime nursings. Picture this. There are roughly 8 million men in service. 700,000 of them were African Americans. There were just over uh, 44,000 Army nurses in 1943, and by that point, there were about 300 uh, African American female nurses who served black troops predominantly. If we get the numbers and we do the math, and I'm not a mathematician, but if we think about the numbers uh, and broke it down by nurses to soldiers, this meant for one, every one white female nurse, there were about 166 to 180, and the numbers fluctuate a little bit, uh, white soldiers that they were taking care of. But for every black, single black female nurse, there were 2,126 black soldiers that they were supposed to be taking care of. We think about the numbers. Now this ratio is disturbing if you consider that almost all of these African American nurses, again, were serving predominantly black troops and or prisoners of war, and most had remained in the United States. At the very least, black soldiers serving abroad suffered from a lack of care. The comparison in those numbers also reveal how continuing racism really weakens the fight for democracy if you think about um, the care and morale factor that nurses really served during the Second World War. Now at a ratio of one to nearly 200, nurses themselves, white nurses themselves, uh, especially in combat areas, are overwhelmed. They are still also dealing with quite a number, high number of um, soldiers that they're taking care of. The report finally found in 1943 that if as many Negro nurses in proportion to their numbers as white nurses were accepted into the Army, then there should actually be in 1943 1,520 Negro nurses in the Army instead of the 300. So you think about that ratio as well. <clears throat> 
1944, race leaders had some hope that changes were on the way. Public conversations about uh, critical nursing shortages, public conversations and debates in black newspapers and mainstream newspapers as well about discrimination faced by African American nurses um, led to the announcement in July 1944 by the Army and the War Department that it would increase the number, not end the quota, but increase the number of nurses serving in the nurse corps. And this is at the same time that the Surgeon General uh, had maintained that no quotas really ever existed just a proportionality to the population. There's a little slight difference in what that means depending on the audience. Uh, so this was widely reported as a positive. The New York Times uh, quoted that the Secretary of War was saying that nurses would be, quote, accepted without regard to race or creed. The headlines of black newspapers read, and I quote, Army, bans, Army lifts ban on Negro nurses. It was, since the war began, the first indication of any real breakdown of racial barriers. And yet, as the image behind me indicates here, there was also real suspicion amongst a lot in the black community about what it would actually mean to break down those barriers. Why did it take so long? And what, what would be the result of this? You know, fears here about uh, what does it mean to, to pull in more and more black females into the army and an army that really, in their minds, um, had not treated them well at all. <clears throat> there was some bright spots. And while most black nurses served domestically, again, in those regions in which black uh, soldiers were predominant, uh, there had been some progress in getting black nurses overseas. In the image behind me in 1944, there was a small unit that went to Li Monrovia, Liberia. That was a short-lived uh, short experience. But nevertheless, they did go. So they're in their desert, desert fatigues here. Uh, in 1940, uh, also in 1943, there was a unit that went uh, as part of the 268 Station Hospital in Australia. Um, and we can see them opening mail in the background here. Uh, we also have nurses who are working in 1944 and early 1945 in the next slide in both New Guinea and um, England as well. And yet the discrimination that most nurses faced in these regions as well as domestically is obvious. In a series of letters from a POW camp in Phoenix, Arizona, Arizona the chief of the, of the black nurses at the station hospital there related to Mabel Stompers, the executive secretary of the uh, National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses, that the reality of their, da uh, their daily lives. In one letter, she discussed feeling isolation, both on and off base, writing, quote, we cannot be served in any cafe or soda fountain. And while all white nurses, uh, white officers, including POWs, had help cleaning their quarters, we are the only women on the entire post without no help whatsoever. So it's in this fray that they are continuing to face discrimination even in the jobs that they uh, are listed to do, and the frustration grows. And that frustration grows alongside of critical nursing shortages. By August of 1944, even after that July lifting of the quota, uh, nurse procurement officers realized that they would need nearly 60,000 additional nurses to keep up with demand. Yet the number of African Americans uh, who had been admitted to the Army Nurse Corps did not increase propor uh, proportionally. By December 1944, when the Surgeon General found it necessary to send 11 general hospitals overseas without nurses, the nurse situation finally hit its crisis. It was this predicament, coupled with the worries about the abilities to care for both uh, the civilian population and fighting men, which led to the uh, Surgeon General Norman T. Kirk to admit, and I'm quoting here, it looks like it will be, uh, it looks like it will be necessary to meet the immediate need for nurses by a congressional draft. So even as we have these nurses traveling all over the world, we also have the possibility of drafting nurses. Conversations about drafting nurses and uh, nurses had been quietly going on for many, many months before this. But in December of 1944, when the Surgeon General had admitted that it that might be necessary, following by the uh, January 6, 1945 um, announcement 
from Franklin Delano Roosevelt that he supported legislation to draft female nurses, uh, there was a real uproar. Three days after Roosevelt supported, announced his support for drafting nurses, Representative Andrew May introduced House Bill 1284, the draft nurse bill, to Congress and later to the Committee on Military Nurses. Against all judgment and support of even his chiefs of staff, uh, many hoped that this would be quickly a resolution to the critical shortage. <clears throat> I'm actually gonna leave this up, but as you can imagine here, here's the response by many black newspapers. The Cleveland Column Post, nation aroused on the ban on Negro nurses, FDR speech okaying draft, uh, drafting of nurses bitterly assailed, January 20th. So I'm not gonna read all of them, but I will say that there was quite a bit of backlash to this. It seemed by the time we get to February 1945, after two months of relentless complaints and demands that a draft of nurses do, does not happen, that there is a shift, the kind of fear that, that drafting women will take place, there is some shift. And nurses start to uh, put in their applications to enlist in the military. They start to go to the Red Cross as well. And by 19, uh, May 1945, uh, the Surgeon General has pulled back from uh, the idea of drafting nurses. And he says, I quote, no further action was to be undertaken because by that time they had gotten enough nurses to kind of assail the, the critical shortages. Ultimately here, and in this last image, we have um, Captain uh, D.H. Rainey, who uh, Colonel Cummings uh, had as well, as it was a wonderful image. Ultimately, by 1945, there are just over 500 black nurses serving the Army Nurse Corps during World War II. And while they amounted to only about 0.8% of the total population, uh, the ANC's campaign of possible drafting and followed by the backlash by the black community and nurse allies uh, meant that officially in 1945, the barriers to black nurses joining the Army Nurse Corps had come to the end. But what this tells us about the Second World War and black nurses is only one part of the story. The larger part of the story can be found in a quote by Estelle Massey Riddle, who said in 1949, professional relations in nursing were so interwoven with race relations that it's been an imperative for Negro nurses to move on both fronts simultaneously to achieve their goals. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce you uh, Elizabeth Norman, who is not only a nurse, but she's also a PhD, so she's a doctor and a nurse at the same time. <laughs> she's a professor at New York University Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development. She's the author of Women at War, the story of 50 military nurses who served in Vietnam, and co-author with Michael Norman uh, of Tears in the Darkness, the story of Bataan Death March and its aftermatch, which made the New York Times list of top 10 nonfiction books in 2009 and was named the 2010 Dayton Literally Peace Prize finalist. Her awards included an official commendation for the military nursing research from U.S. Department of the Army. I give you Dr. <laughs> Elizabeth Norman. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to come back to this museum and to the mission that you have here. And nothing was even, nothing was brought more to the forefront to me today when I walked into an exhibit and there was a group of high school students. That's exactly what, what, what we need to do here. I'm gonna tell you the story of one group of Army and Navy nurses. They were, they're, they were very different from the groups that we've heard about already in that they enlist, they were in the military before the war. And because they were in the military before the war, they uh, were in a segregated unit. It's, it was an all-white unit. And as every other nurse, um, they received relative rank, as we've heard today, which meant you could be a second lieutenant, but you received less pay than the men, and they never were called by their rank. They were always called Miss Smith, Miss Jones. So that was the world they went into. Um, so the women uh, nurses uh, that I'm going to talk about today, uh, they... There we go. Um, they were very much like other American women in that nursing was a very safe profession. But there was something about them that made them a little different from all the other nurses. These were the daughters of immigrants. These were the daughters of factory workers, farmers. 
And they looked around, and I remember some of them saying to me, you know, especially the farmers, they looked at their mother and they said, they didn't want that kind of life. They didn't want that kind of life with that kind of labor. So they went into nursing, but what separated them is that they wanted something more. And at a moment in time when most women stayed near home, their hometowns, their home cities, these women volunteered to go overseas to the Pacific to serve in Manila, uh, of Philippines at the time. So what you see here is a group of nurses on board an army transport ship um, in October uh, uh, 1941, and they're on the way to the Philippines. Up to that point, uh, prior to the draft, in 1940, we started to draft men, and they needed a lot more nurses. They also needed a lot more nurses overseas. Now, prior to the draft, being uh, on service in Manila and the Philippines was one of the best duties in the nurse corps, both Army and Navy. It was called the Pearl of the Orient. And these women came out of the Depression and with everything that was um, involved in that, and they were living in places where they had servants, where they had uh, silk merchants making their dresses. It was another world. This interesting picture was taken in eight, uh, October 1941, and these six young women really thought they were going to have, as they said to me, a good time. And as one of them said, not quite what we expected. But um, four of these nurses became prisoners of war. Um, and they arrived in Manila in October, a month before Pearl Harbor. I also would like to point out in the slide that these women came from South Bend, Indiana, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Philadelphia, Mississippi, Jefferson, Georgia, another Georgian, and from Alabama. So they were from all over the country. And these nurses met, I talked to three of these nurses, they met on the ship, and the one holding a doll, it was her birthday. So they were having a good time. They, nobody gave any thought to what might happen in the Pacific, um, what was going on with Japan. Uh, Pre-war nursing in the Philippines was nice. This is Helen Cassiani. She was the daughter of Italian immigrants who were farmers in Massachusetts, and here she's taking care of a patient. Nursing in the pre-war was pretty good. You worked maybe a six-hour shift. Your patients, the sickest, were those hurt in bar fights, um, Marines hurt in boxing matches, and uh, also there was a big polo team, so you'd get guys whacked with polo. That was pretty much the extent of what they had to deal with. But off-duty, it was um, something. I love this picture. The Army and Navy Club in Manila was the center of life for the American military before the war. And this picture is a group of nurses. They're a little bit older. Um, and I just love the hats and flowers. Um, I was told by many of the nurses that when they, you went over there, you needed really three pieces of clothing. You needed your white nurse's uniform. You needed a bathing suit, because it was hot. And then you needed a long gown, because once the, once the sun went down at the Army-Navy Club, you had to dance under the stars and be with all the officers. So it really was a good life. But despite um, the good times they were having, somebody was thinking about what was going on with Japan and China and Manchuria. And in the fall of 1941, before Pearl Harbor, they uh, issued military ID cards to all the nurses. They took them and filed them away. They didn't think anything about it. But I put this in, because you can see that they did identify the nurses uh, with fingerprints. And there's often a perception, and, and understandably, that the nurses who went overseas were young, that they were women in their 20s, maybe their 30s. But um, this nurse in this ID photo, here she is in a World War I uniform. There were quite a few World War I senior nurses um, still in the nurse corps. And they got to go to Manila because they had the seniority over the young women. But all of a sudden, you had all these young women coming in. But I wanted to point that out. This nurse is Louise Anchex, and she's from Mendota, Illinois. Well, December 8th, we're across the international date line here, so it was December 7th in Pearl Harbor. About 10 hours after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, they attacked the Philippines. The Mitsubishi bombers came over the Zimbales Mountains, and they bombed Clark Airfield, and they bombed Cavite Navy Yard. Now, Clark Airfield, the bombs, it was around noontime. The, the bombers were lined up tip to tip on the um, airfield, loaded with bombs and fully fueled, and everybody went to lunch. 
guess what happened? This is what happened. And the same thing happened at Cavite. Um, although the one thing that happened is they did get some subs out before this that weren't bombed. But these nurses went from treating uh, men hurt in boxing matches to being most incredible trauma that could be. One of the things they learned to do, that they learned to take their lipsticks and write an M on everybody's forehead so you would know before he went into surgery that he'd already had his morphine, so you wouldn't overdose him. Meanwhile, they're crawling around on the floor trying to cut off uh, uh, uniforms and, and medicate people and determine a priority. This is much before triage. Who gets into the OR first? At the same time, they're being bombed. And I remember a Navy nurse saying to me that um, she was in the operating room and she was looking at the fires outside the window of the base. And she said to me, I just had this thought, if they come over one more time, they'll get all of us and our suffering will be over. Well, what happened is, this is around December 8th, 9th, 10th, that the Japanese controlled the air, sea, and land, and Pearl Harbor, everybody kept waiting for help to come from Pearl Harbor, and we all know that wasn't gonna happen. So in early January, in, in, right after Christmas, the army uh, left Manila and its surroundings where everybody had come in after the war started because it was safe, and they evacuated to the peninsula of Bataan, and, um, which was a plan that had been in place. It was an incredible evacu uh, evacu evacuation because they were under constant bombardment. But um, what happened to the Navy nurses, they abandoned Cavite Naval Yard and with, with the Naval troops, and they set up a hospital in a school in Manila, Scanta Scholastica. And they were the first of the nurses to surrender um, to the Japanese on January 2nd, 1942. I just want to point this slide a little bit. This is the whole, there were, these were all the nurses. There were 11 of them there. And I would like to point out the woman on, on second from the left, uh, Laura Cobb is her name. She was the chief army nurse. She came from Wichita, Kansas. And she was career uh, Navy. And uh, they knew when the Japanese came in to that hospital, they were gonna loot. And so what she had the nurses do, and it's a really good example of the adaptability of nurses in situations like this. She had her staff go into the closet where they'd brought all the drugs from Cavite and take adhesive tape and mislabel them. And she said what, I, what she really wanted them to, uh, to do is malaria was endemic in the Philippines. So she said the quinine bottles, they labeled sodium of bicarbonate, this, the, the sodium bicarbonate, they labeled quinine, and sure enough, the Japanese came in, they looted the uh, hospital, and they walked away with more sodium bicarbonate than they ever knew. <laughs> but these nurses got to keep the quinine into prison camp, which was very important. The other thing about this slide, we've talked about uniforms today, and I just wanna point out, if you look at this slide, you'll say, wait a minute, these nurses aren't in their white uniforms. Very early in the war, when the bombings were going on, the Army and Navy leaders decided white nurses' uniforms weren't gonna cut it. So they had uniforms made for the nurses. Now, everybody sitting here knows that the Navy is the Navy and the Army's the Army, and the Navy nurses wore denim and blue, and the Army nurses had khaki uniforms made. So it never changed, but these are what these women surrendered in, their khaki, their, their navy and denim blue uh, uniforms. If you notice in the back row uh, over here, that's Dottie Still, she's from Long Beach, she was from Long Beach, California. She surrendered in a dress that had a Peter Pan collar on it. Um, this, this, this photo really emphasizes how unprepared these nurses were for what was about to happen to them. And when I would talk to them about these slides, they'd say, you have to tell everybody you talk to, we didn't even have calisthenics, let alone survival skills. We had nothing. But they went into prison camp on, um, the other thing about uniforms I just wanna mention, and I, I don't have much time to show all the slides, but first of all, these, these nurses had their blue and their khaki uniforms, but when the army nurses got to Bataan, uh, they couldn't even wear their khaki uniforms, so they started to wear Army Air Corps coveralls. And I have pictures of them in it, and I truly think this is the first group of American military women who wore what we now call fatigues in, in the field. So what happened to the army nurses? Well, they went across to the peninsula of Bataan, and if you can just, the right, um, it was Manila Bay over to 
you're right. And the nurses had no idea what they were going to. They thought it was another military hospital. So they got on the, they got on the trucks, they got on the boats, they go to Bataan. One of them said she brought her negligee, another one said she brought a hair dryer, and they get to Bataan. And this, this slide shows you very much what it was like. It was a fully forested or jungled peninsula with a, a volcano, two extinct volcanoes, and two roads. That road going across the peninsula really was a water buffalo trail. And so they had to set up hospitals here. Now, again, as I said before, the Japanese, they controlled the air, the sea, and the land. And the idea was um, to push the American and Filipino troops and civilians from the top of that peninsula down to the bottom, annihilate them or get them to surrender. And that's what they started to do by January 2nd. I just want to point out at the very bottom of the slide, if you can see it, there's a teeny little island. Uh, looks like a tadpole. That's called Corregidor. And that played a major role in, in, in the battle. Well, when they were on Bataan, um, this was the first time the American nurses were really needed by the military and appreciated by the military. And it's hard to over, uh, that meant so much to them. Because when I would talk to them, I'd say, you were hungry, you were scared. They said, no, they were needed. And that's what they, that's what they did. Now, but it was not easy. This is um, one of the OR set up in a tent on Bataan, number two. On the far left, that's Lucy Wilson. She was from Big Sandy, Texas. And she would say that when they'd be operating and the Japanese would fly over, because there was no air cover, that they would just squat down under the operating room table, put their hands above the table, keep the hands above the table so they would remain sterile. And when the bombing stopped, they'd all stand up and keep, keep working. Um, now, this was hospital number one. Hospital number two was amazing. This was inland. This was not on the coast. And this was a true open field uh, jungle hospital. Um, and the nurses, and I really think this is the first time that there was an open air hospital with patients outside in, in the 20th century. It hadn't happened since the Civil War. Any of you who know anesthesia, they were doing a drip uh, drip anesthesia, which they hadn't done in decades. And uh, this is what the wards look like. This is a, a post-op ward. You can see that they, uh, the Filipinos built um, bed frames out of bamboo. They stuffed mattresses with hay or whatever they could uh, find. And that's what the men were in. And you see the, there's a fellow on the ground there. And if you say, well, where, what happened to all the empty beds? Those were the men in the operating rooms. Um, it was about as primitive as you possibly can. I have to say that as the war continued, they opened up more wards. The Filipinos came in with their bulldozers and opened up land, but they kept the uh, canopy above. So as they would say, Joe wouldn't find them and bomb them. By the end of the war, by the end of the Battle of Bataan, there were 7,000 patients in this hospital. And the nurses said to me, if you want to talk to people about it, tell them, go see Gone with the Wind. And, when they're, and that scene in the Atlanta train station where the camera just pans out and all you see are patients, that's what Bataan Hospital Number 2 was like. Your eyes would get used to the um, jungle and you had covered flashlights to go between. Uh, and this is how they worked. Again, they were all uh, sick and this was the nurses' quarters. Very, very glamorous here. <laughs> they uh, learned to put uh, coffee cans under their the legs of the bed frame so the ants wouldn't crawl up on them. They said the monkeys would go through the trees until they ate all the monkeys. Um, but um, they said we had weevils in our, in our cereal, but we decided, well, that's a little protein, so we'll eat it. I mean, this was sort of the attitude of the nurses. And then they didn't have, um, again, there were no uniforms coming to them, so they had to repair their shoes and they had to repair everything. And this is a picture of Jeannie Kennedy from Philadelphia, Mississippi, sitting on her bed in the nurses' quarters, fixing a hole in her um, coveralls. When they had to bathe, there were no showers, so there was a creek that came through the nurses' quarters in number two. And here's a picture of the nurses bathing. They love to sit in that uh, water and just forget the, just the devastation they were seeing in their patients. They'd sing songs. The girls from Louisiana would talk about their gumbo. The girls yeah. from Boston would talk about their baked beans. Um, I also just want to point out on the far left, there's a woman sort of looking at you. That's Rosemary Hogan from Oklahoma. And she was wounded when these hospitals were um, attacked. But she made it through the war. 
this next slide, and it's always important when you're talking about military and wartime, you've got to look at your leadership because without that, you have nothing else. And this is a slide, it's very, very interesting. Um, on your far left is Josie Nesbitt. She was from Colorado. She, in my mind, was the real hero of the group. She was the kind of leader we all want. She worked you very hard. She worked herself very hard. She also knew to take care of her troops. You know, if they needed a, 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 a shoe, she got it for them. If they were sick, she made sure they had enough to eat. The Filipino nurses who evacuated with the Americans and they needed them in these hospitals because there were 7,000 patients, she took care of them too. She just had that incredible combination of leadership of being strong and very humane. Um, the woman in the middle was the chief army nurse. That's Maud Davison. She's 57 years old in this photo. And if you look at the picture of Maud Davison, you think, I don't think I'd like to work with her very much. But she represented leadership in the mid 20th century. She didn't want to be your friend. She didn't care what you thought about her. But you had to respect her and you didn't cross her. If she told you to work, you worked. And, and if you look at the circumstances and context of the time, they needed somebody like that. So that was Maud. Um, they called her Maud Davison behind her back. And she was 67. The, one, uh, the young woman next to her, and she's wearing air coral, uh, coveralls, that's Anna Williams. She was from uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. She was only 23. So in this slide, you've got a 57-year-old and a 23-year-old. So what happened is um, MacArthur leaves the Philippines, and the Japanese are really making inroads, and they asked the Americans to surrender, and they didn't. Ned King was in charge, so they started to bomb, and this is Bataan Hospital number one. You can see in the forefront of the slide, there's a, a large red cross, and they hoped that that would keep the enemy away. Well, it didn't. It, they dropped two 500-pound bombs on these wards, injuring that one nurse, and they said it was pretty horrific. Patients got blown into trees. Um, there was a lot of death. And it was pretty much at that time, and shortly after in April, that Ned King surrendered the American Army and Filipino Army. That is the largest surrender in American history. 72,000 troops surrendered. Um, now, they didn't want to leave the nurses on Bataan because the rape of Nan King had occurred like three years earlier. So they, they called Josie Nesbitt, that woman from Colorado, and she was the chief nurse of one of the hospitals, and she said, okay, I want your American nurses to evacuate to that little island of Corregidor, um, and she refused. She said, we're not going unless you bring the Filipino nurses. So they were shocked. Josie was a career army nurse. She never questioned an order. But she, they, so sh they said, okay, bring the Filipinos. They saved many lives. The Filipino nurses did not have to go on the death march or become prisoners. And just to give you an idea of the difference between the European theater and the Pacific theater, if you became a prisoner of the Japanese and went into the famous prison camps of Bilibid, Cabanatuan, um, uh, all through the Pacific, the mortality rate of the male POWs was around 40%. If you became a prisoner of the uh, Germans in Europe, like these pilots that we have all see in this museum, your death rate was about 3%. So it was 3%, 40%. You can see what Josie Nesbitt did. So they got across to Corregidor, which is another story to them, uh, in itself. There was an earthquake, they were bombings, but they went across to that little island. Now, before the war, there was a, they had dug a tunnel in, in Corregidor, a Malinta tunnel, and there were lots of laterals off it. And this was the hospital lateral. This was taken in the 1930s. And they, they didn't know if they would need it, but they did. And when the nurses from Bataan arrived and met the nurses from Corregidor, there were 1,000 beds in this hospital, in this lateral. They were triple and uh, quadruple um, uh, done. Um, once Bataan fell and the death march was underway, they went to Wainwright, who was on Corregidor, and said, time's up. He said, no way. He wasn't going to surrender all the troops. So this truly became a siege. That, uh, and then the nurses said when the Japanese would come over and drop their bombs and they'd be in these tunnels, and they said it was very much, they used to joke, this is what it must be like to be inside a pyramid. But it couldn't go on very long, and just before they realized they would have to give up. Um, they were able to get some 20 nurses out on PBYs and subs. Also, they wanted to get the people out from MacArthur's staff who would be helpful in the Pacific War, the people who spoke Japanese, the people who knew 
um, a good strategy. But the nurses, uh, they left to the chief nurse and the chief surgeon, and they decided they knew they were going into captivity. There was no doubt they were going to surrender. Whether they would live or not was another thing. So they chose these nurses. They chose the older nurses, those women in their 40s. Um, they chose <laughs> nurses who were quite sick, and they just didn't know how they would do in prison camp. They also chose those nurses that they said to me were kind of flaky. And they just didn't know how they would do under the Japanese, not too many. And then there were a few nurses they didn't choose, but these were the girlfriends of the men on MacArthur's staff. So they got out, and they were young and healthy, and that in itself is a story, but they got out. However, those who weren't lucky enough, in, in May of 1942, the Japanese landed on the island, the nurses were in the tunnel, and this is one of the most poignant documents I've ever seen. They took a bed sheet and they ripped it and they all signed it, and it says, members of the Army Nurse Corps and civilian uh, women who were in Malinta Tunnel when Corregidor felt. And the, every nurse, every Army nurse signed it, and along the bottom, and I remember saying to them, why did you do that? And they all said to me, we had no idea it was gonna happen to us. They said, we wanted a record of where we were when it happened. We thought the Japanese were gonna take us out to the South China Sea and throw us overboard. And one of the worst things these nurses had to deal with, the worst, if you talk to them, they couldn't get in touch with their families. It's hard for us today to imagine that, but they had no word. And they thought, at least if we have this sheet, we can, our parents will know we were alive on this date and, and where we were. Now, this is in the Quartermaster Museum now. It's been saved. Wow. So it's, it's still around. So they did surrender. Now, Maud Davison um, decided, when they had to figure out what to do, she told her nurses, wear your khaki uniforms, but they didn't, they, again, she said, we want you to wear your Red Cross armbands because we hope that the Japanese will recognize the Red Cross and, and not kill us. So there, the, but the Japanese, they didn't know what to do with these women. There were no women in the Japanese military. So they decided that they would separate them from the men um, and that they would go into a civilian camp. But they also knew that they had a propaganda coup on their hands. So they marched these young nurses out of Malinta Tunnel and made them sit on the, um, that wall there and they told them to smile for the camera. The woman on your far right, um, that's Eleanor Garen from South Bend. I interviewed her and came to know her and I said, what were you doing in that photo? And she said, I was mad as hell. I was not gonna, I was not gonna turn and smile to the Japanese. So that's why she's turned away. Well, as I said, they did, they separated the nurses from the military, which devastated them. But as I told you before, it no doubt saved their lives with a 40% mortality rate. They moved all of the Army Navy nurses into a civilian prison camp in Manila called Santa Tomas Internment Camp, STIC for, um, it's an it's a abbreviation. This was a 60-acre Jesuit university, the oldest in that hemisphere, and it made a perfect civilian uh, prison camp because it was walled in. The, the Japanese could keep control of it, and that's where the nurses wound up. And here's a picture of a group of mixed Army and Navy nurses in the prison camp. Um, and on the far left is uh, Laura Cobb, the Navy nurse who brought all the quinine into camp. What they did when they got there is there were civilian, um, there were civilian physicians in there and they set up a hospital. They set up a hospital across the street from the main camp and that's where they treated all the civilian POWs. Um, and there were kids in the camp, people forget about that, but if you look over in the far right, there's a little boy, his name was Albert, and they called him Terrible Albert because he kept getting hurt and using up all of their very uh, limited supplies. But their, their um, uh, nursing and medical care was, uh, it was at its most primitive. If you look at the bedside stand, it's an upended crate. Um, the nurses, uh, they, what they did is they, they made bandages out of cloth. The pharmacists who were in camp tapped the trees and got adhesive, so they had bandages that would adhere. They used light therapy, they found tin, and some men made bedpans from it. It was just, you can't get more basic than what they did, but they, they went to work. 1942 turned into 1943, and um, for the first time, they were gonna be able, there was a ship that came, and they were gonna, and they, uh, a Red Cross ship, and they took some civilians out, not, none of the military, and they were able to send postcards home. 
And this is an example of the postcard that they got to send home. They were allowed 30 words. And again, it shows the, just the adaptability of these nurses. Many of them put on, they were censored, of course. But what the, um, what the nurses did is they would write, Mom, as of All Souls Day, I am fine. That meant nothing to the Japanese, and it meant everything to their mother. The mother knew when it was. And so that's what happened. But for over a year and a half, this group was listed as missing in action, along with the men. So they kept working, and they celebrated birthdays and holidays. And as the Americans uh, made success, you know, were doing well in the Pacific, things got harder and harder in this camp. Uh, the food really got cut down. Um, and you don't have to be a, a nutritionist to look at the diet that they had. People started to develop beriberi, scurvy, the diseases of malnutrition. People started to die. And the people who died were the elderly. They had Spanish-American war vets in this camp um, as well, and also the young parents who gave their food to their children. It was uh, very difficult. But the nurses really kept going. And how did they keep going? Well. I think it was because they still had a mission. They were still needed. They got to get up every day. They got to go to the hospital. They got to be nurses. And I think the fact that they got to, there were always people in worse shape than them. And I also think that it gave them a reason to get up through the misery of every day and go. Um, they also would sit and say, I never felt uh, that help wasn't going to come. Uh, I never felt that I wasn't going home. Oh, they'll be here by my birthday. Oh, maybe the Americans will be here by Easter. But they always had, they, they never gave up hope. So what happened in February of 1945 is the Americans were very concerned about this camp. There were 3,000 civilian prisoners of war. And the Japanese surrounded them, and they started to move oil drums in. They were afraid they were going to kill them all. So the Americans with the Filipino guerrillas spearheaded uh, a move through the city of Manila to this camp. And they did rescue the camp and all the prisoners. But the issue was the Japanese completely surrounded this urban campus, and there was a terrible fight. But when they first came in, you have to remember it's been three years since they saw an American flag. And when the uh, soldiers came in, they broke through the gates of the university in tanks, and they pulled right up to the building where the nurses were confined with the other civilians. And they got out, they looked up at the nurses, and they knew that they'd been resolved. They, some soldier just looked up at them and said, hello, folks. And they knew that was an American. They saw the, they saw the American flag on the turrets of the tanks, which they hadn't seen in years. And somebody started to sing, God bless America. And it slowly expanded from the tank through all the prisoners. Now, um, Carl Maidens was a famous World War II correspondent. And he was there with the uh, liberating troops. And he said that was one of the most poignant moments of the whole Pacific campaign. You can just look at this slide, and you can see how skinny they are. Those are the nurses up on the roof, because their rooms were up there. And they hung a flag, and they sang. It was truly an amazing um, time. But there was a battle going on, so these women went back to work. And it was during the night, and this is Cassie again, she's taking notes on a sergeant who'd been wounded, that they realized that they'd been prisoners for a long time. One nurse was um, um, closing up on a surgery, and the surgeon turned to her and said, go get me some penicillin. She had no idea what he was talking about. Um, another nurse said to a soldier after, because they were, one of them, she said I was 88 pounds, was looking at a soldier with, who had K rations. And she said, could I have some of those? And he looked at her and he said, lady, you're going to eat these. You must be hungry. So <laughs> these were some of the, they started to realize that some of the changes that had occurred, that they really had been away. Most important, they got to send messages home to their parents and say, I'm alive, I'm well. And as they were filling out the telegrams, one nurse said to a soldier, well, how many words can I use? Again, the Japanese kept every, he said, hell, lady, you're an American. Say as much as you want. So that's what it was. So they came home. And one of the first groups to get out of Santo Tomas were the army nurses. Um, I have to say, every one of these nurses lived. Every one. 77 went into camp in 1942, and 77 walked out including, if you look at this slide on the end, there's a woman sitting down with a cap on. That's Maud Davison. She was 60 years old. 
and she'd been in the hospital with an intestinal obstruction. That's one of the things that happen when you don't have, when you're starving. But she was determined to go home with her girls. And these women made sure she got on the truck and you can look at the nurses around her. They're making sure she's okay. They weren't her friend, but they deeply respected what she did. I just have to say that um, the, doctor, the doctors and the officers who worked with Maud Davison through the Battle of Bataan, um, they put her up for a uh, Distinguished Service Medal after the war was over, and it went all through the chain of command until it got to Washington, D.C. when it was denied. And the denial said, this person's a nurse. She could not have had the responsibility that was required to get the Distinguished Service Medal, so it died until 2001 when the story came out that Senator Inouye and some of the active duty military just were appalled. They got Maud Davis in the Distinguished Service Medal. She was long dead, but um, it meant so much to the people who um, were still around. Now, so the, the Army nurses came home. They all got promoted one rank and had a lot of back pay. Um, these are the Navy nurses, and I just want to talk about this quickly. Um, that uh, they flew down, this is Admiral Kincaid, they're on an island in the southern Pacific, and it's worth looking at. Right in the middle of the picture with the turban is Laura Cobb, and you get a much better picture in this slide of how starved they were. A lot of the nurses had, um, wore turbans and things because their hair was like falling out with, you know, starvation. Also, I want to uh, point out to the, the second from the on the front row, the second from the right there, that is Peg Nash from Wilkesboro, Pennsylvania. And they're in the same uniforms they were in when I showed you that picture of them surrendering in 1942. I asked Peg, I said, what happened to your uniform? Why do you have a white stripe across it? And they were funny when they talked. They said, like, what's the matter with you? She said, I was an OR nurse. I wore that dress every day in camp, and I wore it out rubbing it against the OR table. But they all came home, and just to give you an idea of what they went through in the war, this is um, uh, Minna Anson coming home. This is her before the war. This is her after the war. So you, again, you can get an idea of how starved and sick these women were, and she's from in on North Dakota. So they came home. They were never recognized, um, but they were fine with it. I, they showed me pictures of... Them, uh, they did a lot of propaganda stuff with them after the war. They never talked about these nurses during the war. And I asked people why, and they said, we did not want to remind the American public we had American women as prisoners of war. So when they came home, there was a little bit of celebrity with them. And I'd say, weren't you like insulted being having your picture taken wearing lipstick? I was using my values on them, and they said, no, kid, you got it all wrong. <laughs> we were so happy to be alive. We were so happy to be home. We didn't care what they did to us. So, but, and they never, ever, ever wanted any publicity. So I changed all that. <laughs> um, this is in 2000. This is Helen Cassiani Nestor. You've seen a few photos of her. She lived near me in Pennsylvania, which is why I probably got to know her so well. And um, there was a nursing convention very nearby, and I spoke to the people, and they found out who she was, and they made a little medal that I could give her. And this is me pinning it on her. And the reason I want to show this slide is she looks like she's smiling to the audience, which she was. They were very polite people, but she's talking between her teeth, and she's saying, Beth, I'm going to kill you for doing this to me. <laughs> I, I let it go. So in 2002, my friend Cassie died, um, and that left... Millie Dalton Manning, she too lived, um, she lived in West Trenton, New Jersey with her family. And I really did come to know her after Cassie died. And this is a picture of, of Millie holding her, her picture in 1945 and then her picture that day. She and I visited a lot, um, not a lot, we visited regularly. And she was very aware that she was the last one alive and that when she was gone, this would be it. And we talked a lot about her legacy. Um, and, uh, you know, came up with something that, that would, that she felt would represent the group well, because she knew it was a lot more than her. Well, Millie died in uh, 2011, and she's buried in a uh, military cemetery in New Hope, Pennsylvania. And I went to her funeral, and it was a full military funeral, and I'm going to end with this slide. Um, over on the far left, that's uh, M Major General Jimmy Kimmel. She was Chief of the Army, uh, yeah, 
Keenan, excuse me. She was chief of the Army Nurse Corps. She's about five foot tall, if any of you knew her, but what a dynamo. And she came up from Washington and she's giving the flag to her son. Um, also, the active duty army, they knew how important this group was. So they, nurses, uh, active duty nurses came from all over. I just wanna point out one thing, not only what they were most proud of in the war is that they all survived. They all survived as sick as they were. And that's a statistic unmatched in the World War, both theaters. There were British nurses who died, Australian nurses who died in camp, but none of these nurses died. And they were very, very proud of that. Also, within a large group, you get some extraordinary nurses. And again, this is another story, but Ruby Bradley was one of the nurses in the Army group. She stayed in the military. She was the chief nurse in the Korean War. She was the first nurse to get a full military funeral uh, parade. Uh, Maxwell Taylor really liked her. She was one of the first of three women to achieve the permanent rank of colonel. And when she, um, when, when, uh, and at the end of her life, um, she, they realized she was, and I think still is, the most decorated woman in the history of our country. So again, just embedded in this large group. But I just wanna end with the last two, because it shows you the legacy. You'll, you see the photo, there are four active duty army nurses there. And this was taken in 2013, and all of them had served in Afghanistan, Iraq, or, you know, and, and the fourth woman, some of you may know, that's Wilma Vaught. She's the woman who founded WIMSA. And Wilma felt it was important that she come up for this funeral. And it was just wonderful for the family to have this feeling. And, and the picture in the middle was the one that kind of made me cry. This is the youngest of the Army nurses. She was 23. She had just been in the service. And she's saluting Millie. I thought, you know, how, do, how does it get any better than that? So. Um, what did Millie decide would be her legacy? And we talked and she said, well, she said, here's what I want you to say. And these are the last words in my book. We spent our lives helping people, she told me, and we did it with honor and love and never looked back. Thank you. Beth, I'd like to ask, could you put the slides back up real quick and go back two slides? You pull the slide back up, slide Steve, back. Want, if you don't mind. Out on your slide the, the and, and John, grab your mic, please, when you do so. You want me to sit down? Yes, ma'am. Go back. Go back, please. Okay, right there. Uh, this photograph of this nurse, these mean something. Oh. <laughs> Count them. That means she was in the POW camp. Each one of those is six months. Everything on that uniform means something. And I don't think anything means more probably than those, what looks like a minor marking on her uniform. Six months of captivity for each one of those. And I'm going to thank our ladies for their panel today. We're going to forego the question, but thank you so much. I appreciate it. Jeremy. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dr. Treat and Dr. Norman. Uh, the ladies and John will be outside at the book signing station. I do want to say while listening to Beth's talk, reminded me of my one trip to the Philippines where I had two nurses with me, uh, Dot, and, uh, Dot and Jeannie, and they wanted to go because one of their instructors when they went through nursing school was one of the nurses there in Bataan, and uh, they were not in the service themselves, but it was that important that they make that journey. So um, thank you for the ladies. Thank you, John. And we will be back at 345 for the final session of the day. Thank you. <laughs>